Good evening and welcome. Thank you for coming. It's a great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Professor Chris Quigg, uh, who's here with us tonight. Uh, Professor Quigg is internationally known for his studies on heavy quarks and his insights into particle interactions at ultra-high energies. And he received his bachelor degree at Yale and then his PhD at California Berkeley. He's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and also the American Physical Society and was awarded the Alfred P. Sloan Research Fellowship. And he's uh, met now a member of the Fermilab uh, National Accelerator Laboratory staff. He's been there uh, since 74 and served as the head of the theory group for 10 years while he was there. And he's lectured and written frequently for the general public on aspirations and achievements of particle physics. Uh, he was a consultant to WQED and the National Academy of Sciences for the Infinite Voyage television series and a featured speaker in the Companion Discovery Lectures on College Campuses, and he recently gave the first Carl Sagan Memorial Lecture in the series Cosmos Revisited at the Smithsonian Institute in Washington. And he's also the author of a celebrated textbook in particle physics, which uh, I myself have used, and it's now in a second edition, and I believe he's working in a movie deal if he could get uh, Clint Eastwood to play the part of, La of the Lagrangian. <laughs> so it's uh, with great pleasure that I welcome uh, Professor Qu Chris Quigg with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fred. It's a uh, great pleasure for me to be back in Dallas again uh, and among friends. Thanks to all of you for coming tonight. Um, it's my... Uh, Great pleasure to have uh, been given the challenge of looking back at Richard Feynman's celebrated series of lectures on physics that he gave to Caltech students in, in 1961 to 1963, and to try to respond to some of the challenges that he set out then, and also to uh, give you a feeling for what are the challenges as I see them to our science today. Uh, I knew Feynman, happily, uh, I have to say that he was my teacher long before I met him because I'd uh, seen the videos of his famous messenger lecture series at Cornell University. I think they're still replayed for, for students now. The grainy uh, films have been transferred to DVDs, and so it's high technology, but, but I think the films are still pretty bad looking. Um, here's a, an image from one of those films, and the man himself. Uh, so you can see he had the pose of a juggler and things like that. He was a remarkable presence as a lecturer, uh, always highly animated and always a storyteller. There was always a narrative to what he had to say. And he had very strong feelings about the responsibility of a scientist to tell the truth. One of his rules about teaching was never to tell students something that they will have to unlearn later. You might have to simplify, but never tell a lie. And also he was, uh, that, that was part of his creed for the way he did research himself and for the way he hoped other people would do research. Feynman had the habit of judging you in the first 15 seconds that he knew you about whether you were trying to pull a fast one on Mother Nature or you were one of the good guys. If you were one of the good guys, it was very hard to ever slip out of his esteem, and if you were one of the bad guys, you were doomed for life. Uh, luckily, he misjudged me when I first met him. <laughs> Um, and I, I, let me take a minute to tell you about that experience because it tells you something about the man. I was a very serious postdoc my first year out of graduate school at a conference at Cornell University. And I had some paper I was working on. It was terribly important. It, it changed the face of science, I can assure you. Um, and so instead of going to the entertainment that evening, which was a concert on the Moog synthesizer by the inventor, Mr. Moog, member of the Cornell faculty, I stayed in my room and I finished that paper. About 10.30 I went down to walk around and take the air or something. There was Feynman, so I'd seen him, I'd heard him lecture, we'd never met. He came up to me and basically said, what do you know, young man? And sat me down and for the next hour or so proceeded to ask me what I knew, what I was working on, what I thought about. So it was as if he had inserted a catheter into my brain and was sucking out every lonely thought, because I was pretty young and didn't know much. He treated me as if he might learn something from me. So I had the real, uh, real experience of seeing him as a colleague, a uh, person who was interested in ideas and not just his own ideas. And for a young scientist to be taken seriously by one of the gods uh, is a great gift and it's something that he gave to me and I hope that I, I can give to others. So it's uh, uh, a real thrill to, to try to face the challenge of uh, responding to some of his lectures. 
The first three lectures in that two-year sequence that he gave at Caltech were devoted to a state of the, uh, an assessment of the state of science. And in that, he gave uh, very clearly his view of what science is about and how the students should think about it. Let me contrast, uh, introduce his view by contrasting it with uh, something that you see if you look back at the 1898 to 1899 University of Chicago catalog, you know before the list of courses there's always a preference written often by the chair of the department. Uh, I'm sure you have such a thing here at SMU uh, to introduce the subject and to fire up the, the students. So in that era at the University of Chicago, this is how it read. And you have to take a deep breath because those Victorians believed in long sentences. While it is never safe to affirm that the future of the physical sciences has no marvels in store, even more astonishing than those of the past, it seems probable that most of the grand underlying principles have been firmly established and that further advances are to be sought chiefly in the rigorous application of these principles to all the phenomena which come under our notice. Deep breath. An eminent physicist has remarked that the future truths of physical science are to be looked for in the sixth place of the decimals. Well, as the ink was drying on those noble Victorian sentiments, uh, Rentgen discovered x-rays and published the famous picture of his wife's hand that was seen in newspapers around the world. Uh, Henri Becquerel in France discovered radioactivity by seeing the action of, uh, of uranium salts fogging uh, photographic plates. This was followed up by Marie and Pierre Curie and their discovery of radium and elaboration of the ideas of radioactivity. J.J. Thompson in England discovered the electron, the first elementary particle, by tearing atoms apart. And Max Planck, uh, contemplating the black body spectrum, this, the spectrum of light that's put out by, uh, by warm objects, discovered that the laws of science required revision not in the sixth place of the decimals, but actually in the first place of the decimals. So I have to say, when I, when I give lectures about a future, the future, I have the temptation to make a statement like my colleagues did 100 years ago at the University of Chicago in hopes that the gods will punish me in the same way that they punished them by having a reign of discoveries. Well, Feynman's approach was very different. He was a man who had helped to shape modern physics, but he didn't start out by saying how much we knew. In his first lecture, he begins by telling the students, this isn't going to be easy. We're in it together, but we're in it for the long term. Uh, and part of the reason it's not going to be easy is that we don't yet know all the basic laws. There is an expanding frontier of our ignorance. One of the themes for Feynman was the importance of doubt or ignorance, both in everyday life, in human affairs, but especially in science, that unless you acknowledge what you don't know, there's no way of making prog progress. If you pretend that you have all the answers, why go on? So this was his introduction to the Caltech students. You can imagine that they're a fairly self-confident bunch of kids, and to be told by one of the gods of modern physics that you don't know it all, and by the way, I don't know it all, I think was a good, uh, good medicine for them. So I'm going to devote the first part of the talk to talking about one of the themes that was important to Feynman that he communicated in those early, lecture, in the early lectures, and what's happened to it uh, since then. Feynman tried to imagine what uh, information we might, might want to convey to our successor civilization. Remember, this is a time in which the world was a pretty risky place, or seemed so. It was just a year before the Cuban Missile Crisis, so tensions were high between East and West. We talked about uh, uh, mutual annihilation and so on, and so this was on his mind. And he said to the students, if in some cataclysm all of scientific knowledge were to be destroyed and only one sentence passed on to the next generation of creatures, what statement could contain the most information in the fewest words? I believe it is the atomic hypothesis that all things are made of atoms, little particles, that move around in perpetual motion, attracting each other when they are a little distance apart, but repelling upon being squeezed into one another. So you'll see the subtlety of that. It's not just there are atoms. It's something about the behavior of atoms. In that sentence, you will see, there is an enormous amount of information about the world if just a little imagination and thinking are applied. Now, the idea of atoms has been around for a very long time. Uh, it goes back 2,500 years. We all know that the Greeks invented the concept of the atoms. Uh, we find the famous poem on the nature of things by Lucretius, in which he talked about atoms and said, look in my lines here, you can see the letters common to many of the words, but you know perfectly well that resonance and meaning, sense, sound, are changed by changing the arrangement 
how much more true of atoms than of letters? Well, that's an argument from authority. It's not an argument from experiment. And in fact, through the 19th century, atoms were convenient fictions in which many of the leading scientists did not believe. It wasn't just because they were dense. It was because it was hard to actually produce experimental evidence for the reality of atoms. Atoms are very tiny. They're 500, 1,000 times smaller than the light that we can shine on them. And we simply can't look at them closely enough to see them under ordinary circumstances. In fact, it's quite striking to know that the concept of atoms, the experimental reality of the concept of atoms, is less than 100 years old. So many of us in this room have actually known people who walked the earth when atoms weren't real yet. Here are my grandparents, half of my grandparents, with a future scientist. Uh, these are people who were alive before atoms were real. It wasn't until 1908, in a wonderful set of experiments by Jean Perrin in France, where he measured the uh, motion of atoms induced, uh, the motion of large objects induced by the uh, thermal motion in fluids of the individual atoms. And what's striking, looking back, is uh, Perrin, five years later, wrote a popular book called Atoms, published first in French, then in English. Even after this evidence was produced, the controversy didn't die. There was, there was a Nobel Prize winning chemist who refused to uh, admit that atoms were real. And so Perrin felt that he still had to make propaganda for the reality of atoms. So he has this wonderful, charming phrase to divine in this way the existence or properties of objects that we haven't yet experienced directly. To explain a complicated visible by a simple invisible. That is the kind of intuitive intelligence to which we owe the concept of atoms. Uh, the experiment that uh, was done by Perrin was to study what's called Brownian motion. Brownian motion is the motion of largest, largest ob objects like little balls of glass or plastic or uh, little pieces of pollen large enough to see in a microscope that are buffeted by the constant thermal motion of the fluid in which they're immersed. And by studying the degree of the buffeting and how far they move in a given amount of time, you can actually make a statement about the size and the weight of the individual atoms, the individual things that are hitting them. We owe that calculation that allowed you to extract that information from Perrin's uh, measurements to this young boy, Albert Einstein, one of his famous papers in 1905, the wonderful year that we're celebrating this year, uh, the anniversary of which we're celebrating this year as the World Year of Physics, was precisely on this so-called Brownian motion, the motion discovered originally by an English botanist named Brown, and giving the equations that could be used to analyze the kinds of measurements that were made by Jean Perrin. Well, today, in contrast to the time when atoms weren't real, and in contrast to Feynman's time, we still can't see individual atoms because we haven't done anything to change the wavelength of light and the size of atoms. But people have built wonderful instruments called scanning tunneling microscopes that operate on the quantum principle but basically move on an atomic surface with very fine control and move up and down, sort of like the phone, an old-fashioned phonograph needle in the groove of a record, to keep a constant distance above the atomic surface. And by scanning back and forth, they can give us pictures of what the atomic surfaces look like. So here is the atomic surface visualized, not directly seen, but visualized from those measurements of a shiny piece of nickel. You see here the positions of individual nickel atoms represented in this way. There's a lovely picture of uh, silicon. This is the surface of silicon, that marvelous substance that's used to make so many semiconductor and electronic devices. And so you see the regular pattern, this hexagonal pattern. The colors, of course, are just chosen by the observers. That's not the real color of silicon. They chose to make it look like, uh, like frozen peas because it looks way cool if you do that. <laughs> and you'll notice that for the most part it's perfect hexagons, but here and there, like in this place, there's a little defect in the crystal structure, and you can even see that. Well, people have gone further, not just observing the surfaces of uh, crystals but, uh, and individual positions of individual atoms, but actually picking up individual atoms and moving them around to create uh, structures of their choosing. I think the way this happened was this. Uh, many of you have taken biology courses, and you know you do the, the lab work with microscopes, and 
you're in there and you see something really interesting, you want to get a really close view on it, so you sort of grind the objective down, and then you hear this cracking sound. And you look around. Well, I'm sure that there was a graduate student who did a similar thing with a very fine probe with a scanning tunnel and microscope. It's a thing that you make to be exactly one atom thick at the tip, so it's really a sharp point. And probably was grinding this down to get a closer view in that, oh my god. Uh, and then picked it up and moved it away and noticed that he had managed, he or she had managed to pick up an atom from the original surface and shake it off and move it to a different place. And so as the story goes, the first structure made was uh, the name of the boss, <laughs> which was IBM in that, in that case. So IBM was written in individual atoms and you know, then how can you blame the person for having destroyed the instrument when they've created something? So they've created these quantum corrals that allow us to uh, make measurements to reproduce in reality the quantum mechanics problems that we've been using to, t to torture undergraduates for years and years. What happens to electrons trapped in a corral, for example? There it is. And in principle to make uh, all sorts of devices that will be useful for switching and for other applications. If Feynman never saw these things, it would have been wonderful for it to have his take on, on them and to, to see how he would use them in, in teaching. Uh, people have gone further. Uh, here is uh, something, some work done recently in Madrid in Spain. On the left hand side you see a surface of silicon on which there's been dusted individual atoms of lead. At low temperatures it forms a very rough surface, sort of like corrugated metal or corrugated cardboard. Whereas at high temperatures it melts and there's a uniform layer of everything. And what these people have managed to do that nobody did, had done before is to make an arrangement so stable that even as you're heating it up, you can image it and see at each temperature, you'll see the temperature ticking off there at the top right hand corner, at each temperature you can see what happens to the individual atoms at about 86 degrees of above absolute zero, 86 kelvins, the melting suddenly happens. So people are now able to study not just the positions of atoms and to manipulate atoms, but to see atoms as they're changing, as we create reactions or change the temperature of things. Well, what else do we don't know about atoms? Atoms are mostly empty space. So if you think of uh, putting a pea on the 50-yard line of the cotton, cotton ball, the cotton ball, one of those peas that we saw before, the size of an average atom, a typical atom, is as big as the whole cotton ball itself. There's plenty of empty space inside the atom. The, the nucleus itself is very, very tiny, 10 to the minus 13 centimeters or so in size, so very little, whereas the atom is much, much larger, thousands of times larger than that. Partly that happens just because of the rules of quantum mechanics that the electrons that surround the proton have to live in certain quantized orbits that are at some distance from the, uh, the center, from the nucleus. But partly it happens for a reason that's quite weird, and that is that if you look at the sizes of atoms, which we can measure, you have hydrogen here over in the top left, you have helium over here, and just to turn off my pointer, uh, helium over here, uh, cesium here, and so on. What you would think is that the more positive charge on the nucleus, the more the electrons would be drawn to it and the smaller the atoms should be. But instead we see a trend that goes, is complicated. As you go from left to right and you add, um, add protons to the nucleus, things seem to get smaller. That's sort of the way we imagine it. And then when you jump from one side of the periodic table to the other, they get much bigger again. So what's going on here? What could account for that? Well, what accounts for that is something called the Pauli scoop exclusion principle. This was uh, invented by Wolfgang Pauli in the 1920s, around 1925, to explain the way in which different chemical structures were built up from the atoms. And the idea at the end is that no two electrons, no two uh, identical particles can, can occupy the same quantum state. Uh, Pauli, as I told uh, some people this afternoon, was not only a great physicist, he was a bit of a bully. And if you see this picture of him when he was a year and a half old, dressed up like that by his mother, you know why he had to develop a sort of assertiveness uh, about him. He received a prize for his invention, his conjecture of the Pauli principle, this inclusion principle in 1931, and his friend Paul Ehrenfest said this in the presentation. Pick up a piece of metal or a stone. 
When we think about it, we are astonished that the quantity of matter should occupy so large a volume. Admittedly, the, the molecules are packed close together, and likewise the atoms within each molecule. But why are the atoms so big? And then he poses the question we just had. What prevents the atom from collapsing in that way? Answer, only the Pauli principle. No two electrons in the same quantum state. That is why atoms are so needlessly big, and why metals and stones are so bulky. You must admit, Herr Pauli, that if you would only partially repeal your prohibition, you could relieve some of the practical worries of everyday life for instance, the traffic problems on our streets. Well, you can't, as it turns out, repeal the Pauli principle. And it's gone from the state of a conjecture to something that we can actually derive from the fund fundamental principles of quantum field theory. We know why it applies. We know that it's with us, at least in our four-dimensional world, forever. And something that applies to particles like the electron. So that's been known for a long time. It was known to be consistent with the chemical properties of the elements, with the size of the elements, to give us a feeling for why you couldn't pack in more electrons into smaller spaces, because they have to occupy different quantum states. We can use it to understand uh, the properties of the nuclei of different elements. It's uh, present in particle physics all the time. So we've known it to be true, and we've known it uh, to be derivable long after Pauli. But what's uh, happened in the last couple of years is a wonderful set of experiments done by Debbie Jim and her colleagues at the University of Colorado in which they've taken a bunch of atoms. They made a, a gas of potassium-40 atoms. These are atoms that happen to have a half integral spin. So their spin is seven halves or nine halves or something like that. So are they, they are these particles like the electron that have half integer spin. We call them fermions. And by a series of quite cunning innovations developed in her lab and elsewhere, they managed to take a dense gas of these particles and cool them down to within 100 billionths of a degree of absolute zero, 100 nanokelvins. And when that happens, they inspect the distribution of these particles and can show that they have, on average, a higher energy, that is to say they repelled each other, they have a higher energy than they would have had it not been the power for the power principle. So we've known this in the past about individual atoms and individual electrons. What's new in the work of the, the people in, in Colorado is to show quantitatively how it happens for great assemblies of atoms. Uh, and we'll see whether something of practical use can be made of this also. Again, it's an illustration of the fact that no two, two fermions can live in the same quantum state. Great stuff. Well, what about the other particles, the ones that have integer spin, zero or one or two or things like that? They're not supposed to obey, obey the value principle. They're not supposed to be excluded. And in, in fact, as was known by Einstein and Bose and others, it's likely that you can pack arbitrary number of those particles close together in the same quantum state. And that's been done a couple of years ago by a number of groups around the country. Uh, the first included uh, Carl Wyman and Eric Cornell, also at the University of Colorado and the Joint Institute for Laboratory Astrophysics. They chose another atom, one with uh, an integer spin, rubidium-87. And there, here's a little video that shows what happens as they cool it down from high temperature to low temperatures. And the distribution here becomes narrower when more and more at atoms are obeying the same quantum state. You see that again when they get down within about a hundred billionths of a degree of absolute zero, something dramatic happens to this collection of atoms, but it's just opposite to what happens to the correct collection of particles with half integer spin. So this is great stuff. It has to do with good old atoms, atoms talked about for 2,500 years, atoms seen as the key to what we know about nature by Feynman, but used in ways that uh, uh, required the development of, of fascinating new instruments to do. Uh, we can go further, and a wonderful development was made, a theoretical development was made at the end of the 1960s by Freeman Dyson and Elliot Lee uh, in Princeton. Uh, Freeman Dyson is famous for many things, including writing books about science. Elliot Lee is a wonderful mathematical physicist, and they were able to prove the suspicion that people had long held that it was precisely the Pauli principle that's responsible for the integrity of matter, for the stability of matter, for this table not falling apart, for me not falling through the floor. And moreover, we're able to show that had it been otherwise, 
Had the electrons not been spin one half particles, but been spin zero particles, the bosons, that what happens is that all of matter, you take a lump of matter and another lump of matter and put them together, and they slurp together, they become a smaller lump of matter, energy is released. We would all of us be part of some giant, but shrinking, <laughs> amorphous blob of stuff, undifferentiated between one kind of substance and another kind of substance. So we're very lucky, we learned, that our electrons turned out to be spin one and a half particles and not spin zero particles. So it's not entirely a moot question, because some of the theories that we've made conjectures about in the interval since Feynman gave his lectures are theories called supersymmetric theories, in which the electron has a partner that is identical to it in all ways, except has zero spin instead of spin one half. If we'd had the bad luck to inhabit a universe in which the electron turned out to be the heavier partner rather than the lighter partner, we would be part of this amorphous, undifferentiated blob of stuff. Okay. So, so much for atoms, uh, Feynman's central concept to which he introduced the students. And I now want to move on to some of the questions that he left as open, what I think about them today, what's happened in the, the interim, and uh, what may be the questions for us in the future. He gave a review of modern physics, and in particular of the physics of elementary particles, as it was then known. And he summarized it in this way. This, then, is the horrible condition of our physics today. So, you know, it's just terrific to tell kids in their first lectures that the state of the subject is bad and we need their help, instead of saying, we know everything and we know you're not going to get it. That was his, we were partners, and you were a partner with him, whatever you were doing. To summarize it, I would say this. Outside the nucleus, we seem to know all. Inside it, quantum mechanics is valid. The principles of quantum mechanics have not been found to fail. The stage on which we put all our knowledge, we would say, is relativistic space-time. We do not know how the universe got started, and we have never made experiments to check our ideas of space and time accurately below some tiny distance. So we only know that our rules work above that distance. We should also add that the rules of the game are the quantum mechanical principles and that those principles apply, so far as we can tell, to the new particles of elementary particle physics as well as the old of atomic physics. The origin of the forces in nuclei leads us to new particles, but unfortunately they appear in great profusion and we lack a complete understanding of their interrelationship, although we already know that there are some surprising relationships among them. We seem gradually to be groping toward an understanding of the world of subatomic particles, but we do not really know how far we have yet to go in this task. So emphasizing the open-endedness of scientific exploration and the primitive state of our understanding in 1961 of these subjects. So now I'm going to take up a number of threads from that summary and look at what's happened to us. First, we've never made experiments to check our ideas of space and time accurately below some tiny distance. Well, now we've done much more. We've been able to examine space and the rules of the game at much smaller distances. A beautiful set of experiments done over the last uh, five years at uh, four or five universities in the United States and abroad has tested Newton's famous 1 over r squared law of gravitation down to small distances. Now remember, this is the famous apple tree and the moon uh, idea that the same force is responsible for gravity here and gravity there. We know it works out to solar system distances, galactic distances, intergalactic distances, and then we don't have evidence at uh, much larger distances. It's natural to assume it was given to us by Newton and Einstein and the gods, and so it must be true, why question it? But it, physics is about experiment. And so some of our friends have made experiments recently to try to isolate the force of gravity at distances that are very, very tiny, tiny tinier than a millimeter, and to look for evidence of deviations from the famous one over r squared force law. Down to a distance of about a tenth of a millimeter, so 10 to the minus 4 meters, you can say that there's no additional short-range attraction or repulsion with a strength comparable to the strength of gravity. That's an improvement by about a factor of 20 of what was known only a few years ago. But it's still a pretty big distance, some macroscopic distance. And because the experiments are so hard, you only have to go down a little bit, a factor of 2 or 5 or 10, and you see that the bounds on the new interaction are just out of sight. They 
network. It could be a million times stronger than gravity, and we wouldn't have seen it at those distances. The other thing to say is that uh, we've inspected it to these distances, these macroscopic distances, and found gravity is, is okay. But if we convert that into the equivalent energy of our probe, something that's useful com for comparing with experiments in uh, particle physics, we see that this corresponds to an energy of about one milli electron volt. The electron volt is the convenient unit. This is only one one thousandth of an electron volt. Our experiments at Fermilab and elsewhere are at one trillion electron volts. So we've subjected the theories of the other interactions to much more probing tests than we have to gravity, even though gravity's been around forever. So that's one way in which we, in experiments, have tried to probe to short distance. Here's another way. This is my laboratory, the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory in Batavia, Illinois. You might see it if you fly out of Chicago. One of our graduate students thinks that it, we should do a prairie burn in the shape of Leonardo's man because we're a Renaissance, Renaissance people at Fermi Lab. That hasn't happened yet, but I'm in favor of it. Uh, what you see here is a, a cooling pond, a canal, which is uh, inside the ring. The ring is exactly two pi kilometers around, so it has a radius of one kilometer. And that's the ring in which we have our large superconducting accelerator that brings protons and antiprotons into collision at high energies. Uh, one experiment is here, another experiment is there, and my office is right there. Fermilab constitutes, this accelerator plus its detectors concentrate, con constitute the world's most powerful microscope. It's a gigantic instrument to look at very small things. And the physicists who work there, we might think of not as nanophysicists operating on the scale of a billion times smaller than human experience, where atomic physicists uh, play, but a billion times smaller than that. So, for a title, we can think of them as nano-nanophysicists. The instrument is called the Tevatron Collider. The Tevatron is the name of the accelerator, and its detectors, it brings protons in. Together with antiprotons, they're antiparticles at uh, one trillion electron volts. They're going very fast. The speed of light is about a billion kilometers per hour. And our protons and antiprotons are slower than the speed of light by only 495 kilometers per hour. So, you know, an airplane, as it's preparing to land, is going faster than that distance. That also means that uh, they're really whipping around the ring, and they pass my window about 45,000 times a second. What's important for the experiments is that there are about 10 million collisions a second, bringing these particles together concentrating a lot of energy in a small space, shaking up whatever is inside the proton and antiproton, and my colleagues view the debris from those collisions to try to infer what was happening. Here are two of the detectors. This is called the CDF detector. This is called the V0 detector. Uh, each of them is about three stories high, weighs about 5,000 tons, has some, something in excess of 100,000 electro electronic signals coming out of it. Uh, they're very big and bulky. But at the center of them are very fine detectors that allow my colleagues to resolve the positions and uh, times, in some cases, of the hundreds of particles, pions and protons and antiprotons and such things that are produced in each one of these collisions. Uh, here's a, a wire chamber called the, the central tracking chamber of CDF. And here, even further in, is a silicon microvertex detector, which is the finest kind of electronics we can make today to get very high resolution on position measurements and to see, identify all the particles that were coming out and to track them. Uh, you can also see that we're doing secret research at Fermilab on artificial life forms. <laughs> so uh, these people are running day and night, year after year, and um, the CDF experiment has won the lottery in the sense that they have recorded the most violent collision ever witnessed by human beings. It's a collision in which the proton and antiproton come together, carrying one TeV each, and then stuff comes out. It's a burst of spray of particles in uh, two directions, very collimated sprays that we call jets. And those are carrying out about two-thirds of the energy that came into the collision at right angles to the collision. So it's as if two billiard balls hit each other and went bouncing off at a very large angle. It's undoubtedly the collision of a quark from the proton and an antiquark from the antiproton, and it is the single most violent event humans have ever witnessed, therefore the closest look we human beings have ever had at anything. 
and it's together with a statistical set of other experiment, other uh, observations of this kind at Fairy Lab and elsewhere are what allow us to conclude that the basic constituents that live inside Feynman's elementary particles, like the proton, the quarks, have no size that we can resolve down to a distance of about 10 to the minus 18 meters. At higher resolution, we might discover that there's something inside, but down to that, that uh, point, we don't see any gears and wheels, no fluffiness, they're just like geometrical points. So that's one aspect of our basic ideas right now. A second has to do with what happens when you put a lot of energy in a small space. You can make different kinds of matter, not just lots of pions, sprays of things coming out, but also things that nobody had ever seen before. And my colleagues at Fermilab about uh, 10 years ago have made for the first time and observed the top quark. Here's an event in which a top quark and any top quark are produced. This is in the D0 detector. So some of the, uh, the perpetrators are in the audience. And what you see here is a muon going off in this direction, a couple of jets of particles going off in this direction, missing energy going off in this direction. So you balance all the energy that's coming out sideways in the detector, and there's something missing over here. That's attributed to a particle called the neutrino rather than to a defect in the detector. You start putting the pieces together and you see that it's the decay product of a top quark and an anti-top quark. Um, so those, and, and it's a remarkable thing because it weighs as much as an atom of gold or osmium or something like that. So it's, it's got the same mass as things that we know from everyday chemical experience can be taken into a part into a part into a bunch of protons, a bunch of neutrons, and a bunch of electrons. But this thing, as far as we can tell, has no internal structure, can't be disassembled, is just a thing, a basic constituent, at least for our generation of physicists until we get much more resolution. So wonderful changes that you can make by doing these things. So Feynman's second topic was that we're gradually, we seem gradually to be groping toward an understanding of the world of subatomic particles. So I entered uh, particle physics in the late 1960s as a graduate student, and I sometimes marvel at how, given the boring state of the field at that time, and how confused the field was at that time, I had the wisdom to join this field that was suddenly going to blossom in the way it did. Uh, but things took off in a, in a remarkable way. Uh, so let's say a little bit about those things. The first remarkable development was to and this was the last great movement that Feynman participated in, in the late 60s, was to discover that the proton and the neutron, and therefore you and I, have constituents of their own that are tiny, hard, electrically charged. These are the things that we call quarks. So the proton is made, roughly speaking, of three quarks, two up quarks and a down quark. Uh, other things are made of different kinds. So that the, this proliferation of particles that Feynman described in his lecture, of, of protons and the sigma hyperons and the Y stars and the deltas and this and that, all can be under, understood in terms of a few basic constituents and some rules by which they're assembled. And we've even understood the origin of those rules now. Uh, there are, in addition to these constituents, the quarks that make up the protons, or there are the up and down quarks that make up protons and neutrons and you and me. And then there are other quarks that we've named charm and strange of top and bottom that don't appear in ordinary life. They're unstable, they're massive, they just come and go. Presumably they have something to do with the universe being the way it is, but we certainly haven't unraveled that completely. And then there are a bunch of particles called leptons, things like the electron, the muon, and the heavy friend called the tau, and the neutrinos that are a separate class of basic particles and that are seen individually. The quarks are always seen together pairs or triplets or other combinations. The other weird thing about uh, the elementary particles, this was uh, known in Feynman's time, is that only half of them, the left-handed ones, these are spin a half particles, the left-handed ones have the weak interactions that we know about, have radioactive beta decay. The others seem to be inert with respect to the weak interactions. So what's that about? This Is that a fundamental asymmetry in the laws of nature, or will we come to understand why that has happened someday. We don't know. Uh, we find that everything we know about can be interpreted in terms of four basic interactions, gravitation, electromagnetism, radioactivity, and this strong interaction. 
So here's a picture of a very schematic representation of a quark, of a proton made of two up quarks and a down quark of colors that add up red, green, and blue, add up to the neutral color white, or neutral or something. Um, finding these, the set of particles, it's after all not a big set of particles, you can count all of them with on your fingers and toes, and that's always a good, good limiting case. But we have no understanding for the moment of what makes the different species have the characteristics they do. So what makes an electron an electron, a top quark a top quark, a neutrino a neutrino, we don't know, and that's a haunting question. Now, with respect to the interactions, there's been a wonderful insight, not yet appreciated in the early 1960s, although it came before that. Uh, you're all familiar with the famous uh, slogan of the Chicago architect, Louis Sullivan, uh, shown here with the Carson Perry, Carson Perry Scott Building in Chicago, which still exists. That form follows function, that uh, the way a building looks, the way it's put together, should follow from the uses of that building. Wonderful slogan, very influ influential in architecture. Uh, two of our colleagues in 1954 turned it around and decided that function should follow form, by which they meant that interactions follow from symmetry. It's a wonderful, far-reaching idea that if we do experiments and we recognize symmetries in nature, there's a procedure we can follow that starts with those symmetries that we see in nature, or believe that we see in nature, and from them derive the fundamental interactions, like electromagnetism, the strong interaction that holds quarks together, and the weak interaction responsible for reading. It's the basis of all the theories that we make today, the basis of huge success in theories that we can calculate and validate against experiment. And that was certainly underappreciated in the 1960s. It means that the way people, even Feynman, were thinking about the problem of coming to terms with the behavior of the strong interactions was at too distant a level from where the real action this is a recurring lesson that sometimes we have to take a broader view, sometimes we have to take a closer view. It's the, the obvious, obvious picture isn't always the right one to think about. Okay, so here are the, the basic sets, say, of quarks and leptons. There are three theories that we now talk about. One is the theory called quantum chromodynamics, a uh, theory of the strong interaction for which three of our colleagues received the Nobel Prize last fall. David Gross, David Pulitzer, and Frank Wilczek, they postulated, they noticed that if you made a theory based on asymmetry, indistinguishability among red, green, and blue quarks, the ones that have these, these labels that denote that they uh, suffer the strong interactions, that you could make a theory that described, uh, successfully helped us interpret why we could think of quarks is acting as if they were free within protons, but if you try to remove them from the proton, they can't be removed, and so on. And has helped us, here's a simulation of what's going on inside a proton. It's fields of gluons, the particles that hold the quarks together are going this way and that way. And the big insight we have from this theory is that the mass of the proton is made not of the masses of the individual quarks that you add up, because it turns out that the up and down quark weigh next to nothing but it's made up of the energy stored in confining those three quarks in a small space. So for the first time, when I was a student, when Feynman was giving his lectures before, the mass of the proton was something that you looked up in a book, and if you went to your professor and said, where does that come from, uh, how could we change it, they would have sent you off to the philosophy department. So in the way that happens frequently in science, Questions that seem out of our reach, that we don't know how to pose, that seem metaphysical questions, do come within our reach. We can see first that they're scientific questions, and then we can answer them and give scientific answers to them. So we can actually calculate from basically nothing now the mass of the proton and the mass of the other particles that Feynman was worried about. In the, this is an interesting case because it's one in which the, our ability to calculate the mass of the proton came almost before we had realized that it had become a scientific question. Things moved that rapidly. So this is a theory that's stupendously successful and gives us insight into the structure of matter at a very basic level. We've also made a theory together, the weak and electromagnetic interactions, that is based in part on the family symmetry that you see depicted here between up and down the quark, neutrino and electron, and so on. 
of course we can distinguish a neutrino from an electron because a neutrino has no charge and the electron does have a charge. But it turns out to be profitable to make a theory that treats them as members of a pair that can be transformed one into the other by the weak interaction. And this is an illustration of something that comes out later in the Feynman lectures. It's a very important principle. Symmetries are terribly important to the progress of physics. And we've learned that it's profitable, indeed essential, to, to demand symmetry in the laws of nature. But that doesn't mean that there will be a symmetry reflected in the consequences of those laws. If you look around the room, we are all held together by electromagnetism. Electromagnetism doesn't care which direction you look at it. Uh, it's the same left and right, up and down, forward and back. And so according to the laws of electromagnetism, there's a spherical rotational symmetry about the basic laws, but there are only two or three perfectly spherical people in this room. It's not commonplace that that happens. So, so it's uh, quite common in nature that the expression of the laws doesn't reveal the full symmetry. And one of the tricks that we have to learn to deal with is to look at nature in such a way that we can see behind the surface reality and imagine what symmetries might really be there, make our calculations, try to understand what it is that's hiding the symmetries from us. There may also be a symmetry between quarks and leptons. That too would have to be a hidden symmetry because some have strong interactions and some don't. And we've made up theories of that kind. So this is my rendering of a perfect world. My children have, are accustomed to seeing me walk around in the fog, but I claim it's part of what I do. Because part of the job of a theoretical physicist is to try to understand what the world would be like if these symmetries were actually realized. If there were a state of perfection, if they hadn't been hidden from us. And one profitable thing that we try to do is to imagine a world in which the, uh, all the particles are massless, they're all moving at the speed of light, all the forces are interchangeable, uh, quarks aren't confined, all the particles are free, all the particles are brothers, you know, all of that stuff. Uh, and it's, it turns out it's, it's a very easy world to think about. It's also a perfectly boring world because everything's moving at the speed of light, nothing sticks together. You can't have any complex structures, and so it's much less rich than the world that, that we inhabit. But it's very interesting to think about that world, the perfection of that world, and how such a story might actually relate to our everyday world. I like to think of this as the world of the French Revolution, because of the liberty, fraternity, and equality that's, uh, that's part of it. Our current quest in uh, particle physics has a very practical, or at least applied every day uh, goal, and that is to understand the everyday world. This too is something that uh, was very important to Feynman. You, you can hear it in some of his lectures. Uh, when in that first lecture he says to the students, consider someone standing on the beach and looking around and contemplating nature. Is the sand other than the rocks? That is, is the sand perhaps nothing but a great number of tiny stones? Is the moon a great rock? If we understood rocks, would we also understand the stand in the moon? Is the wind the sloshing of the air, analogous to the sloshing motion of the water in the sea? What common features do different movements have? What is common to different kinds of sound? How many colors are there? And so on. In this way, we try gradually to analyze all things, to put together things which at first sight look different, with the hope that we may, may be able to reduce the number of different things and thereby understand them. So we're off doing these things that are remote from common experience, you know, smashing protons and antiprotons together, making top quarks, seeing jets of stuff come out. All of us, I think, got into physics because we have a curiosity about the everyday world, and we hope that by doing these experiments and theories far from everyday experience, we can better understand the everyday world. So we're on the verge in the next five to 10 years of giving atom answers to these questions. Why are there atoms? Why is there chemistry? Why are there stable structures? And even, in the limit, what makes life possible? I think this is terribly exciting. It's one of the grand adventures of the human spirit. And it's something that uh, we're going to be able to do through our experience in the next, uh, next few years. To understand why this is what we're doing, let's imagine what the world would be like if that electroweak symmetry between up and down quarks and neutrinos and electrons weren't hidden from us, if, it, if the world just showed that. Well, 
it turns out that you can analyze this because we have the theories that allow us to do so. And you find that first thing is that all the particles would be massless, so they all go zipping around at the speed of light all the time. Quantum chromodynamics, this theory of the strong interactions, doesn't care about that. It still binds the up and down quarks into protons, and in fact, binds all the other quarks into structures like the proton. Since most of the proton mass in our world comes not from the masses of the quarks, but from the binding energy, it doesn't change very much. It turns out that the strong interaction itself also does a little trick on the electroweak symmetry, so that we're left with electromagnetism, conveniently. Because we have electromagnetism and the proton has a charge but the neutron doesn't, in that world the proton is heavier than the neutron, in our world the neutron is heavier than the proton, because of some quirk in the masses of the down and up quarks. So the proton will actually decay by radioactive decay into the neutron. The lightest nucleus won't be hydrogen, won't be the proton, it will be a neutron. The neutron has no electric charge, it's not a terrific nucleus for an atom. There are probably, made in the equivalent of the Big Bang in that universe, uh, light elements like helium, so you can have a charged nucleus. But the electron has no mass, and so the radius of the helium atom will be effectively infinite. So this is, you know, everything's a free electron. There are no, steps, no small structures. At the size of atoms makes no sense. You can't have chemistry, all of that. It's an interesting world. It's actually quite subtle to work out what it would be like. But it's not our world. It's fantastically different from our world. And as we understand in our experiments over the next years, the origin of electroweak symmetry breaking, why that symmetry isn't shown to us directly in our everyday world, we're going to understand in a very fundamental way why we have atoms in chemistry and stable structures and so on. Will that be an insight with that we can apply te technologically? Probably not, at least not for a long time. But it will be infinitely satisfying to understand how it is that our world came to have the form that it does. Here's an example of the form that our world has, which is um, the result of a microburst in a French forest that took out all the pine trees and let the, uh, left the chestnut trees standing. So it's an example of the diversity and change of the everyday world. Now, you may be a little puzzled about how you could have a symmetry that's present in the laws of nature but not reflected in the outcome. Think of the following experiment. I invite you to do this when you go home. Take a bottle of wine. Uh, the better the wine, the better the experiment, it turns out. Empty the bottle of wine by the means of your choosing. <laughs> and then you'll notice the bottle of wine has a little dimple at the bottom, like this. Take a pearl, the better the pearl, the better the experiment, and place it at the top of the dimple. So this is a place which, according to symmetry, the pearl shouldn't go anywhere, right? It's point of equilibrium. It's being pulled in all directions at once. Well, you may have to do this experiment a number of times with a number of very good bottles of wine. <laughs> when you do that, you'll find that if you wait long enough, you know, by some vibration, somebody walking elsewhere in the house, or by a quantum fluctuation, for that matter, the pearl will always drop. If you do the, ex the experiment again and again, you'll find that the pearl, in a perfect bottle and perfect pearl, the pearl goes with equal probability in every direction. That's the sign that there's an underlying symmetry. But if you look at the outcome of just one experiment, you'll find that the symmetry is broken. In much the same way, we can have constant circumstances in our world that lead to the hiding of a symmetry because the outcome of a particular fluctuation leads us this way. Or that way. There is some mysterious new force that hides the electroweak symmetry. Uh, we don't know if it's a completely new kind of force, a new force that will arise from new symmetry, or something completely novel. And we don't know which path nature has taken. But experiments to be done over the next five to 10 years, when we can bring quarks and any quarks together at energies approaching one trillion electron volts will tell us that. And the place those experiments will be done, taking over from Fermilab, is that the Large Hadron Collider being constructed now in Geneva, and to begin operation in 2007, it will bring protons and protons together at seven times the Fermilab energy, so it's much more capable. Protons there are faster, they go within 10 kilometers per hour of the speed of light. And this ring is not 2 pi kilometers around, but 27 kilometers around. So it's a really monstrous uh, uh, structure under the, uh, the, the ground or outside Geneva. It's happening now. It's very exciting. If you go there, 
or you can watch on the webcam and you can see the Atlas detector, one of the large detectors for this. Again, some of the perpetrators are in the audience tonight. Uh, being assembled before your eyes, here are uh, pictures showing large coils that will provide a magnetic field for the detector being lowered into place. Uh, so there's a new picture every half hour. You can see when they're working and when they're not in Geneva. Uh, here's a photograph I made in the Atlas cavern in uh, February. You can see it's really coming together and in the course of a couple of years, it will be uh, the successor to the experiments now going on, on at Fermilab. And this set of experiments is going to teach us what's behind electroweak symmetry breaking, therefore why we have atoms, chemistry, and all the rest. Uh, here's one of my colleagues, one of the uh, young leaders of the Atlas experiment, Fabiola Giannotti, explaining to the president of Italy, Mr. Ciampi, the meaning of hidden symmetries. Uh, you can see that he's following it all with great interest. <laughs> and, and this person is utterly fascinated. So this, this shows you that uh, these, these are compelling notions for, for real people. Uh, I'm sure that all of you are on intimate terms with our president, and so I hope the next time he comes to town or to Crawford, one of you will give him the lecture that Fabiola is giving to President Chompy over there. It would do him a world of good, and it would do uh, our physics a world of good. And I bet he'd like it. Okay, next issue has to do with the unity of quarks and leptons. I said, here are these two different kinds of particles. What do they have in common? Well, what makes me think that they have something in common is that atoms are, to a very good approximation, neutral. Atoms, so let's think of a hydrogen atom. One proton, one electron. If you measure the total charge of that atom in units of the proton charge, you get 0.0000. .0000 21 zeros and then experimental noise. This is the best measured zero in the universe. Beautiful experiments that have allowed people to conclude that the proton and electron charge are really well balanced. Now, maybe they're not quite balanced, but I bet against that. I'm going to take it as a data point that they really are equal. If the quarks that make up the proton and the electron, well, as a represented lepton, have nothing to do with each other, well, then why did it come about that there's this exact balance between them? charge and the electron charge. So I think it's natural to have a very strong suspicion that these two class, classes of basic particles really have some fundamental unity, some fundamental uh, origin, com common origin. So let's say they go together. Well, which quarks do we put with which leptons? We don't really know. I showed you a quark a chart that had them in some order, but that was just the order in which we met them. That doesn't mean anything. One consequence of having extended families of quarks and leptons is that there will be transitions between quarks and leptons, and that can in induce reactions that we've never yet witnessed directly, like the decay of protons. We know decay, the protons don't decay very quickly because most bodies that began will be our here are still here. We haven't disintegrated. We haven't given ourselves cancer in the last 45 minutes by the radi radiation in our bodies. And so we know that it, the proton lifetime is very long. In fact, from those simple arguments, you can easily prove that the lifetime of the proton is many, many times longer than the age of the universe. So if we're going to do an experiment to look for a proton to decay, good luck if we look at a single proton and wait for it to decay. But what, what can we do? We can look at many protons and hope that one or a few of them will decay. So some colleagues in Japan have done just that. They've built a very large swimming pool. I think it's something like uh, 40 meters across, 20 meters high, 20 or 30 meters high. Uh, lined with 11,000 phototubes, photomultiplier tubes, and filled with very pure water, 50,000 tons of pure water. Uh, what you see over here is the graduate students going around in a life raft, polishing the faces of the phototubes as they were filling it with water. And so they installed this detector, and they've been waiting for a long time to see a proton decay and send out stuff that would make a blink and say, I'm a proton going out of existence. They haven't seen any so far. And they're able to say that the lifetime of the proton is at least 10 to the 33 years, whereas the lifetime of the universe is only a few times 10 to the 10th years. So protons may not be forever, but they last a really long time.